Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar hosted by Pearson. I want to thank Pearson for inviting me to host this webinar. Uh, good morning to everybody, or if you afternoon no, good evening, this is good morning to me. So I think that we are all ready to start working. So I will be dealing with the topic of teaching in pandemic times, quite a, quite a challenge for all of us. Teaching young learners is always challenging, I mean, teaching is challenging, but teaching young learners in pandemic times, uh, teaching them online, that's even more challenging, uh, especially when we have to change the system we deliver the lessons from and kind of overnight. So there was no preparation for teachers or for learners and their families. There were no transitions. So that was quite a, quite a challenge for everybody. Then there are these false beliefs that teaching online is exactly the same as teaching face-to-face, -face, only that you are mediated by a screen. And I think that you all know that's definitely not the case. Some people think that, okay, teaching online, especially in the case of the learners, this would be second best, since if we cannot meet them online, okay, so let's do something different. Now, I want to contend that even though teaching face-to-face -face has advantages, uh, teaching learners online should not be second best. However, what we need to do is to consider that teaching is about creating opportunities for our students to learn, and we should do so maybe differently when we teach online. So let me move on a little bit. In general, when you read articles, when you listen to experts, when you read expert articles, uh, especially during pandemic times, these are the terms that tend to come up loss learning or learning loss, the need for students to catch up, that there has been lack of progress, there are gaps in students' learning, and that learners are behind in curriculum learning. All these elements have something in common, I mean, they're all negative, but they are also based on a deficit model. The idea is that learners are already behind and from there we move on. And of course, if we start from this perspective, that will affect the way we address our learners and the way we teach. Those who say that learners are behind, that there has been learning loss, I don't think they are considering the nature of the learning part. I mean, learning does not progress in a straight line. I mean, sometimes you go sideways but only to see a new topic in combination with some other topics. So that, this, I mean, this is the essence of this spiral curriculum. I mean, it's not just going in a straight line. And even when you say, I mean, I go in a straight line every now and then, I recycle and then I move on. It's linear anyway. And we know that learning is not linear. So going sideways does not mean that you are not moving forward, does not mean that you are not learning. And then if you're already checking how far behind learners are in the curriculum, you're already presupposing that they haven't been learning enough. Now, I want to refer to different specialists in the field of education. The first one is from uh, uh, from the University of Texas. Uh, this is an article he wrote in 2019, not as a result of pandemic, of course, but as a consequence of the summer break. And what he says is that not learning does not equate not being at school. If you consider that people can only learn or students can only learn when you are at school, that's not telling the truth, is it? Of course, we can all learn without a teacher. Now, I'm not saying that teachers are not necessary. We are. The role of teachers is to create opportunities everywhere and at every time for students to learn. Teachers can make learning better, more effective, can make it lifelong. But it's not true that without a teacher, we cannot learn. The second specialist 
I want to quote is Dylan Willen. This is the British uh, specialist in education and an expert in assessment as well. He says that often the focus of tests, especially those at the beginning of, of the year, focus on how much students have uh, have forgotten and not so much on what they know. And he quotes Bjork, another specialist in uh, memory. He says that retrieving from memory is not the same as having learned. In other words, retrieval strength is not the same as storage training. Lenore, uh, I'm sorry to disturb you there, but um, the audio is not completely clear. Um, is there any chance you have a headset or can you speak closer to the microphone or louder, perhaps? Okay. Sorry to disturb. No, no, that's right. I don't have a headset with a, with a microphone on, so is it any better? For me, that's that's better, yes. Um, and okay. people are saying okay, yes. So, okay, um, so thank you. Sorry, uh, sorry, people, for this. Uh, I'll speak louder and uh, closer to the uh, to the screen. Would that too? Okay. Sorry about this. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. So going back to this idea, I was talking about learning, uh, learning loss, and then this idea of making a difference between retrieving from memory and having learned. And I want to quote Ebbinghaus and his famous, his well-known curve of forgetting. What he says is that when something is presented to us, when we are taught something, we will remember most of it. But chances are that after a month, we will just remember only 20% of that. Now, there are different things that we can do about this. The idea is the following, and this is shown by this if you do some reviewing, some integration, I don't mean repetition, but some reviewing, integration, uh, immediately after class, you're likely to remember more. If you do, I mean, if you do that only after class, but then no more, again, after a month, you will only remember about 20%. If you go back to these new topics 24 hours later, and not again, chances are that after a month you will remember about 40%. If you do this reviewing after a week, chances are that after a month you will remember about 60%. And if you keep on reviewing uh, after a month, it means learners will remember about 80%. So this is something that will definitely affect the curve of forgetting. And even though he wrote in the 80s, and this is not a typo, he did write in the 1880s, his findings are relevant still today. There was a study carried out in 2015 by a group of researchers who found that his findings are still relevant today. And I want to focus on key aspects of uh, his findings. He says that it's easier to remember things that have meaning. The way something is presented affects learning, positively or negatively. In order to learn and remember, the information we present needs to be meaningful to learning. And this applies to teaching online, but also to face-to-face -face teaching. It applies to, it applies to all, all instances of teaching and learning. Now, there is another loss I want to refer to, which hasn't made it to, uh, let's say, to all newspapers or to all academic articles, which is another type of loss which has occurred as a result of very long lockdowns. In some parts of the world, students have been able, haven't been able to have face-to-face -face classes for a year. And even though there have been instances of online teaching and online learning, what they have lost is this possibility of socializing, of meeting peers, of working with them. So what we see here is the value of education, not just instruction. The idea is that content we can compensate for if we haven't uh, been accessing con uh, content. 
But there are aspects of education, there are aspects of schooling which are crucial for young learners as they are growing because they learn how to socialize, how to live in society, and this they do at school. So this is another loss which is common in many parts of the world, but in general, which is not tackled by many uh, specialists. Now, I've been talking about education in, in general. Now, let me talk about the world of uh, ELT now. In general, there are fewer periods online than, uh, than there are when you teach face-to-face. -face. So, for instance, if you teach three periods a week, when you're teaching face to face, then when you teach online, maybe the possibility is just one period and only maybe 40 minutes or one hour. So as teachers, what we need to do is to consider the nature of learning, the learning path, to make the most of the time with our learners, to prioritize and reorganize content, and plan in terms of learners' communicative and educational needs. How do we do that? Let me give you an example. This is a situation. We have to teach the simple present tense. What concerns do you have? What things come to your mind? Can you please write that in the chat? I can see routines, timeline. Habits. Frequency, frequency adverbs. Question forms. Different uses of a simple present tense. Facts, regular activities, repeated actions, habits, routines. Okay, thank you. For your contributions. Just one thing that I read in the chat. Uh, I'm using uh, a webcam, and that's why if I read a presentation, when I look at the presentation, I don't I don't make eye contact with you. But I'll try to do uh, to do my best to focus on eye contact. I've asked several teachers. I've conducted some uh, a survey, and there were several concerns. The ones that you are uh, expressing, the ones that you are. Uh, talking about in uh, in the chat, and some other issues came up. The idea of do and does. I mean, the use of auxiliaries, the use of yes for the third person uh, third person singular. So different ideas come to your mind when you teach the simple present tense. Now, let me pose another question to you. This is a situation. Imagine that you're going to spend a holiday in Japan and you don't know any Japanese. And you have the possibility of having a teacher teach you what you need. What would you ask this person to teach you? Again, the situation is you're, move, you're going to Japan for a holiday. What would you ask this person to teach you? Shopping vocabulary, how to bargain, mm -hmm. survival expressions, Greetings, basic vocabulary, base, basic conversations. I mean, maybe asking asking for help, money. So it has to do basically with situations. Yes, not with any grammatical concepts. And I've asked several teachers, and the situation I posed to them was moving to Japan, and again having the possibility of hiring a teacher. And what they said was that they would ask basically for intercultural advice. I mean, what you're supposed to do when you meet your fam your I mean your children's teacher, if you go to the uh, to the doctors, how to travel, how to use public transport. So again, there is no uh, no reference to tenses, no reference to any grammatical concepts not even any areas of vocabulary, which come up maybe when you think in terms of the simple uh, present tense. Then you would say, okay, I use a simple present tense to talk about routines. Okay, true. Now, suppose that I told you this morning when I started the uh, this webinar saying, you know, how are you? 
Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And you know, I get up early every day. I have coffee for breakfast. And then I turn on my computer and start working. You may understand what I'm saying, but I don't think you would understand why I'm saying that. So there's a difference between meaning and meaningfulness. So when thinking about situations in Japan, either as a tourist or as a person living there, you would focus on meaningfulness. You would focus on language as social practice, not only language as a skill. And again, you would be focusing on language in any context in particular, rather than language in context in general. So going back to the simple present tense, and uh, let me give you an example of how you can go about this in pandemic times. So you will present, for instance, in this case for young learners, this is a comic in which there is a, a boy from, uh, from an indigenous community who goes to school with other classmates, and he talks about his weekend routines because they are quite different. There may be another example. Uh, let, me work, let me work in this one. From the point of view of the teacher, you would say, what's my point? I want to expose students to the test. But from the point of view of the learners, learning a test is not meaningful. Maybe they need to work on how to express routines to play for different reasons. So it's the teacher, and this is the role of the teacher, to work on meaningfulness. And let me give you another example. Suppose that you're introducing this text to older learners, still within the realm of young learners, but older. And this is an article about life on the International Space Station. Again, if you say, I want to tell students about the simple present, then that's not meaningful. We have to think in terms of what students might, might find meaningful. And this is when we should work on learning objectives. Learning objectives are expressions of what students should be able to learn, to do, to accomplish as a result of teaching. Now, let me show you, I want to show you the, uh, the idea is again, we need to remember what I said, that we need to revisit our syllabuses, we need to reorganize content when we teach online because the dynamics are different and we teach pure period. So let me show you an example of learning objectives. And the teacher toolkit can be extremely useful. So this is, if you just Google GSE teacher toolkit, you will access this. So you choose young learners, you may choose the skill, in this case, I will choose the four language skills. And i just give you an example. If you work on simple present, there are no results because the simple present tense does not constitute a learning objective. Whereas if I decide on a story because this is what I'm presenting my students with. Then there will be definitely many more options. Let me just see how many options you can see. For example, can uh, students can follow a short familiar traditional story if supported by gestures and repetition? Can understand the main idea in a short, simple picture story. Uh, can follow a short, familiar, traditional story supported by pictures. So there are many more things than learners can uh, that you can find as a teacher when you're working with learning objectives. These are just a few other examples which you will get in your uh, presentation. So let me move forward a little bit. 
the GS Suppose said you find learning objectives which are a little bit above your student's level. So in this case, what you can do is you scaffold the activity so that learners can access that. In the case of the article on the International Space Station, first there's an activity in which you activate learner schemata. You may teach the, uh, the language that they need. So they have to read the statements and think if they are true or false. Then they read the text and they go back to their predictions. Then there's a second exercise which focuses on the general gist of the text in which they have to match the headings with the, uh, with the paragraphs. Now, we are. let me go back to this idea of the simple present tense. Now that we have decided on learning objectives so as to work on the point of view of meaningfulness, now we have to devise activities for online classes. Activities should be short. They should keep learners active. I mean, this applies to classroom, but of course, in the classroom, if a learner gets distracted, if it's face-to-face, -face, maybe you can go to the learner, you stand next to him, of her and you get his or her attention back, which is not something you can do when you're teaching online. And we should create, design, or adapt activities which are reuse, reusable and which generate further activities. Let me give you an example. Remember that the example was simple present tense activities at the weekend. So I present the learners with this calendar online. And what they have to do is they have to tell me if what I'm saying is true or false. They can use a thumbs up or down. They can show maybe a tick or a cross. You may say, okay, for them to be active, if it's true, they should stand up. And if it's false, they should sit down. You can do that. The thing is that you equate this with yes, positive, And we equate this with no, negative. And maybe learners may find it more challenging to equate standing up with positive or negative. But anyway, that's another possibility to keep them active. So I may tell them, for example, that on Saturdays I have a big breakfast and they will go this way because maybe cookies or biscuits and a glass of milk is not a big breakfast. I tidy up my room on Sundays. So they go like this. So I use the calendar. I can use the same calendar for repeated correct activities. So I may keep, keep the calendar on the, uh, on the screen. And so I say, I play volleyball on Saturday. And if it's true, they repeat it. If it's not true, they remain silent. I can make it even more challenging and combining a memory game with repeat if correct. I can also uh, work on a blank calendar page. Then I will, uh, towards the end, I will work on some tips on how to involve families and how to work with materials that you will need. Anyway, the learners can just draw it. You can submit it beforehand. You can upload it onto the school blog if there's one. And there will be an activity dictation. So you will dictate what you do at the weekend, maybe during winter or during summer. And what learners have to do is to, uh, is to draw pictures, not two words, but draw pictures. And then the task, I mean, what gives meaningful, uh, meaningfulness to this is to check how many different pictures learners have drawn for the same activity. So maybe when you say, uh, I sing with a group in the afternoon, maybe one draws a microphone, some other may draw a musical note, some other may draw at the mouth of a person singing. Okay, so the idea is that they will draw different things and then you compare and you see how many different drawings there are. Learners can then uh, do, I mean, make a video at home in which they show their routines, what they do at the weekend. They can also take photos and write captions about their daily activities at the weekend or during the week. And I want to make a difference here to refer to the difference between home tasks and homework. Again, home task would be uh, a term which is a, uh, which applies to 
pandemic times, but it can be used in any other context. You can do activities from the course book if you have a digital component. Now, the thing is that remember that when teaching online, in general, you teach fewer periods than you would if you were teaching face to face. So what we need to do as teachers is to provide further opportunities for learners to use the language meaningfully. Okay, So we need to think of some activities in which the learners will be active, but at the same time in which there will be some sort of record. So that can be videos, audios that students record, photos. There are several apps online that, uh, that you can use in which students post messages, post ideas, post photos. So the idea is to keep them very uh, active all the time. Now, there might be the case of, I'm sorry, and, and as you get uh, homework, in this case, I mean, we all know what homework means. You can use the activities from your course book. And the teacher toolkit can provide several opportunities also for homework. If you go to the teacher toolkit and you click on the grammar tab, you can then ask for, you can then uh, enter simple present and you will get different activities. For example, in this one, in one of the findings, if you open this sign, you get the structure, you get examples, and you get related learning objectives. And then in some other cases, if you get the folder file, that means that there are activities that you can first preview and then download. So that would be for homework, not for classwork, not for home tasks. So let me catch up a little bit. When we teach in pandemic times, we have to revisit our syllabuses and we have to plan differently. We have to start from learning objectives, thinking in terms of meaningfulness for learners. And then from those learning objectives, we plan a unit of work in which we need to consider activities which are short, which will keep learners active, and which can be reusable by us, and which can generate further activities. So far, apart from the first book, I've only used a, a calendar page, yes, and from that I can generate several other activities. The idea is that still the teaching cycle applies in which you can, you go and create opportunities for learners, to, for students to learn, and you assess all throughout. Notice that there are arrows pointing uh, in both direction, in either direction. Yes, because it's not just linear, not always in the same direction. But you plan, you go into the classroom, you assess, and then you go backwards and you modify your plan because you think that some things need replanning. Okay. Now, when we teach online in this paradigm, which, by the way, applies to face-to-face -to -face teaching as well, the learner should be at the center. And then there are questions that we should ask about three main variables, which are the teacher, the content that we need to teach, and the context in which we are teaching. As regards the content, what we need to ask ourselves as we revise our syllabus is what are the skills, what concepts, what competences our learners need to acquire? And from this perspective, then we plan. So not in terms of grammar or structures, but in terms of learning objectives, considering meaningfulness to learners. As regards context, these are some questions that you can ask yourselves, such as, I mean, when, with whom, with whom I mean. In the case of younger learners, of course, you will need the support of the family. If it's in the classroom, then you need to consider other variables, such as, for example, will I need digital resources in the classroom? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But if you're teaching online, you definitely need uh, digital resources. 
Now, which ones do you have? What resources will your students have? So these are the questions that you need to ask as you're planning the unit. And then the teacher's role is to plan, considering these variables, considering the context in which you have to teach and what you have to teach. Again, this applies to face-to-face -face and online teaching, which is particularly um, something that you need to pay attention to because sometimes learners complain, families complain that one thing is what you do when you teach online and some other difference is some other difference is what you do when you teach face to face. And learners find it difficult to go from one way of learning to another one. The idea is that when you plan with these variables from this paradigm, then learners will feel that teaching online is not just a completely different world, but a different means, but not a different method, let's say, a different methodology or a different uh, approach. Let me share some, uh, some tips. One of the things that helps a lot is to construct some ground rules, some learning contracts. Online teaching requires, I mean, online classes require a different, uh, different dynamics. So the idea is when you construct these ground rules, when you create this learning contract, you are part of the contract. It's not always you do this, you do that, you do this other thing. The idea is that you are part of the teaching and learning community, and so are your learners. So when you involve them, they will be more likely to go by the rules than if you just impose the rules on them. So create this learning contract in which you are proactive in the sense that you help students understand what they have to do. So forget about don't do this, don't do that, but rather work along these lines, do this. This learning contract can be very useful for group objectives and individual objectives. And again, it's important that you should involve your learners as a way of challenging them. Suppose that to get organized for the calendar activity, in which the students were supposed maybe to either download uh, the black calendar from uh, the school block or draw one. I mean, we show them on the screen and they draw one. Suppose that it took them, I don't know, quite, uh, quite a number of minutes to get ready. And so you would say, okay, Today, the preparation for this activity uh, has taken up, let's say, uh, 10 minutes. Do you think that tomorrow, to get ready for an activity, we can do it in fewer minutes? And then you discuss different strategies for learners to beat their own record. So this is what I mean by involving them. And of course, if you set a learning objective, of course, uh, or a group objective, then of course there needs to be feedback to say, okay, yeah, today you were better, so we uh, we were able to beat our own record. And this is, again, the role of the teacher. Suppose that they are getting ready for an activity or they you're doing some listening activity in which they have to listen and do something without any interruptions, and sometimes learners might find it difficult. So you say, okay, let's let's see if this can work in five minutes. And you see that after three minutes, learners are likely to lose their concentration. So you say, okay, time's up. So as to focus on what's positive and not on what is negative. As individual objectives, of course, you wouldn't discuss them together with the rest of the class, but you can work with students who are maybe too shy or overactive and don't let others participate, or students who would permanently, I don't know, draw on the screen and delete pictures and, you know, intervene, kind of interfere with your presentation, with the activities. So you would talk with these students, and I mean, in isolation, maybe yeah, on a chat involving families. And so you set an objective for this student in particular, and of course, there has to be some feedback to it. In the case of younger learners, 
it's crucial that we involve families. I mean, learners cannot do that alone. In general, what I've done, and that works a lot, is to, I mean, in the school block, uh, there's a folder for Afro English, and that folder is divided into uh, two or three, uh, four, three apps of folder. One is students' productions, and this is where students upload their productions. Another one is home tasks, in which you tell students what they have to do. And another one is information for families and students. And in this information, so you tell families what students need when, and of course you do this in due time so that families can get everything ready. Usually I tell them that maybe on Sunday evening I post all the homework for the rest of the week and my classes are not on a Monday, which means that they have time to prepare. Some families prefer to have the weekend to get materials ready, so you say, okay, I will post then the information for the following week on Wednesday or on Thursday. I mean, you name them, but that's a way to involve families because in the case of young learners, they, we do need the family support. This is what I mean by focusing on uh, involving, focusing on challenges to involve learners. Yes, They are useful in any type of teaching and learning situation, but even more so in uh, when you're teaching online. You can work on some uh, an activity which I don't have you been paying attention today. And so at the end, there's some sort of quiz saying, for example, okay, today, did I drink any water during the class? Did I scratch my uh, my head at any time? What was the first? What, uh, which was the first word that I said when I when I started the the meeting? That sort of thing, which is not related to teaching uh, teaching and learning, but to being actually being in the class. So as learners don't know what the quiz will be about next time, then there will be that they are likely, let's say, to pay more attention. It's also necessary to reflect on performance, showing learners how everybody is making an effort in online teaching and online learning to make things work, and acknowledge that sometimes uh, things, the different things are more challenging. We depend on technology, we depend on so many variables, and we are not there to make to change things as easily as we are when we are teaching in a classroom face uh, to face. And we need to be able to remember that whenever we ask learners to do something, there should be some reflection on their performance, on what they did well, on the topics that they have been learning, on asking them what they've been learning about as a form of assessment and letting them show that teaching online is a valid way of teaching and a valid way of learning and not second. Second this, I was, uh, as I was telling you at the beginning. Let me show you some other tool, some other uh, resource from the teacher, uh, the teacher toolkit. It may be the case that sometimes, uh, because you need to teach learners in a meaningful way, contextualized, situated, Maybe there's something in the community you want to talk about. There is some article which is interesting. For some reason, you want to introduce a topic and you don't know whether your article, your material will be uh, at the student's level. So let me show you how the, uh, how the teacher toolkit can help. So I go again to the teacher toolkit, and I go to text analyzer. I just give it a title. Yes, in this case, I already I already have my text, so I paste it, and the text analyzer will analyze my text in a matter of seconds. Let me show you. So I click on analyze the text. It's analyzing the text. And this one can calculate the level, the GSE level of, 
any text very accurately. Okay, see it here, I have the results, pretty amazing. So this is information that I get. So at GSE level, this is 29, about 29 to 33. If I want to check the level at the Common European Framework of Reference, it tells me that it's at A2 level. I also get the word count, the sentence count, other readability measures which you may find useful. And there is something which is very interesting and useful for me, which is it shows me what vocabulary is above the level of the text that I'm going to use. And this is where I make decisions as a teacher. One of the words which, uh, which is signaled is manager. Now, I may consider that learners will know the term because it's frequent in the community, and so I decide not to uh, erase it. I have to read the text, thinking where or analyzing actually whether these words are crucial in understanding the text or whether they provide some not key information and so I decide to leave them in the text so as to create some sort of noise. What I mean by noise, this idea that when you read a text, there will, there will be words you don't know, but still they do not prevent you from understanding the text as a whole. So I may decide to change some words or not. I may decide to leave the words there or not. Again, that's up to you as a teacher. So going back to, uh, let me go back to the presentation. Yeah. So the idea is, again, when you're teaching in pandemic times, some things are the same, some things are different. Maybe there are always positive aspects in anything. This is my own belief. And one of the things that to me the pandemic has brought with it is the need for us teachers to rethink what we do in the classroom and why we do things. So it's given us the opportunity to reflect on our own teaching. And as Kumara Rivelu says, not just reflecting in action as to what we do while we're teaching, but also reflecting on action. What does that mean? Once you've complete, once you've taught a lesson, going back to it and considering what works well, why, what didn't work so well, and why, so as to change things for the following uh, for the following time you're meeting your learners, whether it's this group or some other group. Again, as in every case. Reflection is the power, the key, or the engine that will keep us moving as teachers, creating opportunities for learners to learn at all times. So this is what I wanted to uh, share with you. Now I'm sure there will be questions. Sorry for the uh, for the audio. Um, sorry for not keeping eye contact at the beginning. But again, this is what happens during uh, pandemic times when you uh, have to depend on technology. Okay, so ready for your questions. Any comments you need to make? Right. I see lots of, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, reflection is very important. Actually, it's through reflecting, through becoming aware that we learn. If there's no reflection, then learning is much more difficult. And we're not aware of how much we are learning. Hi, Lenore. I thought I would just jump in there while the questions come in. Um, okay. Apologies to everyone for the audio issues there, but we are all dealing with teaching online and, and handling new technology and so on. But in the end, it was a, a great webinar. So, so thank you there, Lenore. Um, again, while we wait for questions to come in, I can uh, just let people know that the tools you've seen today are from the GSE Teacher Toolkit. Uh, this is a free resource. 
and you can find it following the link that I'm going to ask my colleague to share in the chat box now. Okay, it's english.com forward slash GSC forward slash toolkit. Uh, and we will pin that at the top of the chat box now. Um, I haven't seen any more. There you go. It's in the chat box. I'm pinning it to the top now. So all oh, please do go and have a dig. And Lenore, there's the first bit you showed me with the learning objectives. Is that correct? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, could you come again? The first part that you demonstrated was the uh, learning objective tool. Yeah. And the second part was a text analyzer. The text, uh, the text analyzer. And then I didn't go online to that, but then there's also the possibility for grammar in which, uh, I mean, you get not only grammar exercises, but then how different grammar topics. I mean, there are lots of possibilities for grammar, not just tenses, but phrasals, tenses, structures. I mean, lots of different possibilities. And uh, you've got examples, different meanings, different uses, and uh, connections, different relationships with uh, learning objectives. So if you go to the teacher toolkit, and I emphasize that it's absolutely free, and uh, it's an enormous, uh, enormously powerful resource. So you've got the learning objectives that will help you rethink in uh, your lessons. They will also help you towards assessment, because you know where, the, where you're going, where you want your students to go, and of course you have to assess accordingly. So they really guide uh, our activities. And when you choose activities, you remember that these activities should contribute to these learning objectives. So this is when you know, okay, which activities you will use, as is, so to speak, which activities you will change, which activities you will adapt. So it's not that you use an activity just because you have it. Okay? So this is the role of a teacher as a professional making informed decisions. So this is about learning objectives. Within the grammar, you've got the possibility of different exercises for homework, not for home tasks. Again, you've got vocabulary. I didn't go into vocabulary, but you've got lots of examples and worksheets for vocabulary, and then the text analyzer, which is, to me, again, a magnificent uh, tool to us to check that you're on the right track, that when you create your own text, or when you use text from different sources, then they are at the level of your learning. Brilliant. Well, I'm not a teacher myself, but I know that it's a very powerful tool. I've seen countless uh, demonstrations through these webinars myself. So I would encourage everyone to uh, click on the link at the top and sign up to it. Um, I think I'm going to have to conclude the session there, Lenore. Uh, we just about run up to time, and I know that uh, the next session uh, is ready and waiting to go, uh, which, if I'm not mistaken, is a, is a coffee break with uh, Ken Beatty. Um, so, Lenore, thank you so much for presenting uh, today. Uh, it was a really uh, great webinar. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Sorry for the inconveniences. And uh, join uh, Ken in the coffee break. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic. Bye -bye. And I will encourage you all to join the panel tomorrow, which Lenore is also taking part in. Uh, so please uh, head to the English.com website and you will see a banner for spring days and you can find uh, you can find lots of more, lots more sessions there from the spring days uh, web series. Thank you for joining us and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Cheerio.